going on with the Lord. It's got to have your heart. Got to be surrendered to the Lord. This is a challenging message. We're going to depend upon the Lord to give us understanding and help. In verse 1, And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto Jesus a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And Jesus taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his teaching, Hearken, behold, which means to stop, look, and listen. There went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of, of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of the earth. And when the sun was up, it was scorched, because it had no root, and it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. And Jesus said unto them, He or she that hath ears to hear, let them hear. Then Jesus, not Mark, but Jesus interprets his own parable starting in verse 14. The sower soweth the word. And these are they that by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they that likewise which are sown on stony ground. Who? When they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with joy, with gladness. And they have no root in themselves. And so endure for a season or a time afterward. When affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches and the lust, the desire of other things entering in, choke the word. And it is unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundredfold. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the understanding of his word, the heart factor. Now, you need your Bibles today. This is a teaching here. Uh, and he says in verse 2, And he taught them many things by parables. Many things by parables. That word is defined in Zodiac's word study for the New Testament as a comparison in which one thing is compared to another. And most of the time we just leave it off there. It is a comparison where we're comparing one thing to another thing. In this context, particularly spiritual things with natural. Comparing spiritual things with natural things. Now listen to this. And this is why Jesus is doing this by parables. By which means such spiritual things are better understood and make the deeper impression on the honest and the attentive here while simultaneously they are concealed from the carnal and the inattentive. In other words, Jesus uses simple stories out of their culture, out of their time, that everybody understands. And those individuals who really have a heart to know the truth and to experience the truth in their lives, it helps them connect the dots and understand. And it helps them understand the truth. But on the other hand, those people who don't care, those people who have carnal hearts, hard-hearted hearts, they could care less. It doesn't help them a bit. It just confuses them and just aggravates them. Have you ever uh, been in a situation where somebody's telling you some long story or some joke that you didn't want to hear and you didn't have time for it, but just because you didn't want to be rude and blow them off and then be mad at you, you stood there and listened to all of that stuff? How did that turn out for you? <laughs> you get to the end, you ain't got no idea what they're talking about. You don't get it. Why? Because your heart wasn't in it. Amen. 
You didn't get it because you get lost in the details. But if you want to know spiritual truth, and you've got a heart to understand it, when Jesus gives His word with a parable, that comparison will help you understand that truth. And you get it, praise God. Amen? Amen. And so He teaches in parables. Now there's a comparison here that I want to make sure that we all understand the comparison is the sower is the servant of God. In verse 14, it says, The sower soweth the word. The sower soweth the word. It could be a preacher. It could be any brother or sister who's sharing Christ with uh, somebody, sharing the gospel with him. They're sowing the seed of the word of God. The seed is the word of God. It tells us that in verse 14 and 15. And Luke's account of this tells us very plainly the seed is is the Word of God. The seed is the Word. The other comparison that's very important to make sure that you understand is that the souls in this story are the conditions of the human heart, of the spiritual heart. Everybody's heart is not in the same place or the same condition when the Word comes upon them. You've got a hard-hearted individual here. You've got a shallow-hearted individual. You've got a uh, a crowded heart here in this story. And then you've got one that's prepared to receive the word. What Jesus is teaching in this text is very alarming to many people. And it is simply this. That some people who respond to the word. Just because a person responds to the word doesn't mean that they're saved. People can respond to the gospel. People can respond to the word, even a positive response, and not bear spiritual fruit and have the evidence of a changed life. We often wonder what happens to people. We see people get saved. We see people go through a discipleship program. We see them baptized. And then suddenly, little by little, they just slip out and they're gone. And you see them out and you try to encourage them or you text them or you call them and encourage them to come back. It's like they just don't have time for it. Could this be the reason why they don't have time for it anymore? I'm not saying that this is the only reason, but I am saying that this is a biblical reason why some people just keep, seem to fall away and have no interest anymore. Let me tell you something. I don't say it. Once saved, always saved. You better be very careful about saying that. Yes, sir. Listen, if you are truly saved by the grace of God and the power of God is in your life and you have the evidence of a changed life and you have the fruit of a changed life, then yes. But this text here, this teaching gives us some cause for concern. We need to make sure, make every effort that as we are dealing with people, we give them every opportunity for their heart to be prepared and ready to receive the gospel so that it will germinate, bear fruit, and uh, bring glory and honor to God. Amen? Amen? So let's take a look at this and see what the Lord has to say. First, I want you to see what I'm going to call... Conditions of concern. There's some conditions here that we need to be concerned about. As we're soul winning and as we're ministering to people and sharing the gospel, there's things that we need to be aware of. In verses 3 through 7, you have the parable. In verses 14 through 19, we have Jesus interpreting his own parable to his disciples, telling them exactly what he means and how people's hearts different conditions of people's hearts respond to the word. The first one I want you to see is, is the word is stolen away. You say, are you kidding me? No, I am not kidding you. The word is stolen away in verses 14 and 15. The first example, the sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word which was sown in their hearts. It says that the word was taken away. Who does this, students? Who does this? Satan. Satan does. Satan comes and takes away the word that had been near their heart and on their heart. It registered in their heart. It says he takes it out of their hearts. Hey, 
I didn't write this stuff. Jesus did, okay? This is hard for us to deal with. I understand that. But listen to what the Spirit of God is trying to teach us about this. That the Word is taken away, is stolen out of the heart. Jesus said in John 10, 10, that the devil is a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And here he is stealing the Word of God off of this heart that is really a hard heart. It's a hard path. A hard heart is the idea. And the enemy comes in and steals this Word right off. Now, if you want to go to Genesis 3, you can see whatever, what else the old devil does. He likes to twist the truth of God. He likes to cause people to disbelieve, disbelieve the Word and to disobey the Word. Adam and Eve, go look what happened to them. This is what he is all about. Deception and stealing away the truth. Trying to twist the truth and steal it away. So, the Word is stolen away. Next, the Word has no root. In verses 16 and 17, it says, And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness, it's joy, and have no root in themselves, and so endure for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. The idea here is shallow commitment shallowness of ground, shallowness of heart. This is a superficial emotional response to the word. You tell people, man, you need to be saved so you can be forgiven of your sins and spend eternity in heaven and avoid hell. Well, who, will, who doesn't want that deal? I mean, think about it. It's easy. Hey, man, I'll pray the sinner's prayer and ask the Lord to forgive me and ask him to come in my heart and, and forgive me so that I can go to heaven when I die. But then, notice what happens in the text. It says that they receive it with gladness. There's joy. But they endure for what? It's the time. They make headway for just a little bit. And then what happens? It says that when affliction or persecution arise for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And they start doing this. No. No, my grandma's having her birthday today. I got to go to do that. Grandma's having the birthday party right at church time. Well, God gets the boot, we go to grandma. See, there is a cost in following Jesus. We are called to live a separated life, to live under his lordship and honor him on his day. But the heart that is not changed, the heart that is not God's, when trouble starts coming into their life, persecution starts coming, when they begin to understand, hey, you've got to live a separated life. You can't do everything that you used to do. You belong to the Lord now. It's like, mm. they're offended at the Word. Usually, that offense is directed to me because I happen to be the poor sap that's trying to tell you the truth. <laughs> you get mad at the messenger. Hey, don't get mad at the messenger. I'm just a messenger boy. I'm just trying to do what God would have me to do and bring the truth to you. And the truth is, they have no root, spiritual root in their life. They have no maturity. They have no sustaining power. It takes the power of God to overcome the flesh and the stuff of the world. And you've got to have that power working in your life so that you can overcome. But those who are shallow... Those who've got half-hearted commitments, oh, the first little thing that comes up, they're gone. They're offended. I cannot believe that God would have me to be here every week. I cannot believe that God would want me to separate from all of this fun. I can't believe. I can't. They're offended at the word. Shallow, have no root. Then number three, the word bears no fruit. And this third example, and listen to this one, 18 and 19. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Verse 7 tells us that it was choked, and it yielded no fruit. This heart, again, has the word near them. Uh, 
close to their heart. There may be some foliage here. There may be some good response here. But what happens? It says that the word is choked out. That word choke, I, you talk about a word picture. This is why we do word studies. This word defined in Strong's Concordance, choke means to strangle completely. Not strangle just a little bit. <laughs> strangle completely. Ah! Choke the life out. To drown. No enemy get his hand on your head. Just keep you down. To crowd. Figuratively to crowd. So many influences in the heart. It just crowds out the word. And it chokes out the word. Yeah. Woo. Yes, sir. Now what does your text say? How does that happen? How does that happen to a person? Who's received the word. It's making that positive response. How does it happen? The cares of the world. It's that grandma business again. It's all that entertainment and all of that recreation and all that stuff that we just got to do. We're killing ourselves. We're, we're wearing ourselves out entertaining ourselves to death. Wearing ourselves out recreating. The deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. Honey, if you have a steady diet of TV, it'll warp you. <laughs> because they want to make you dissatisfied with everything you got from your wife to your kids to your car to your house. To your job, everything. You can do better. The lust of other things. Entering in, it chokes out the word. Are we listening? Yes, sir. So many influences in the heart. The word, as powerful as it is, doesn't have a chance. It's choked out. Hmm. Say, this is messing with my theology. It is challenging. <laughs> I'll say that. I'll agree with you. You've got three hearts here. Hard heart, shallow heart, and a crowded heart. And not, not any, any of these hearts that we've looked at bears spiritual fruit that gives evidence of a changed life. There's no power to overcome the cares of the world. And the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of everything, of other things. And I tell you before, and I'll tell you again, it takes power to be a Christian and live the Christian life. Amen. You got to be regenerated. You got to make sure that you are His, and then you walk in obedience. And when you do, He'll release His power so that you can overcome. But none of these examples bear fruit. Now, this is a concern for us. The conditions of concern. Can you see that? That's the corner of my backyard. And can you can you see that little blimp back there on that porch? Right up there? That's a big old mud turtle. And for a long time, when we lived with uh, our son and his daughter and Lila, we had this big mud turtle that come to visit come through the yard, made regular trips through the yard. And when that thing came, you'd think the second coming of Christ had happened for a while. I mean, she was so excited about that bird, bird turtle because it hung around a little long chew grass and it moved so slow and all like that. That just tickled her to death. And they named the turtle Tommy Tortuga. And so when we saw Tommy Tortuga anywhere, we was hollering, wow! Tommy's here, Tommy's here. And she'd go out and she'd watch that turtle and be so tickled by that. Well, they moved out. They built two houses right beside us and pretty much ruined the turtle habitat, so to speak. And we don't see Tommy anymore. Every once in a while he comes, just every once, maybe once or twice a year. And so when we see Tommy, it's pretty, I mean, it, it, we get excited. Even though Lila's not there, I holler, no, Tommy, Tommy's here, you know. <laughs> so I opened the blinds last week or two weeks ago and it was still, you know, kind of dark and darkish and all like that. But I opened the blinds on the back door and I could see into the uh, back lot and I could see that on the porch and I said, Tommy's there, Donna. And, 
And then I didn't pay any attention. I was off. I was busy. Go have some time with the Lord. All that kind of thing. Then I saw it the next day, for just briefly. And then the next day, I took some time to watch Tommy. I could see Tommy's still there. He's been here for three days. <laughs> Guess what? It's not a real Tommy Tortuga. It's a fake one, a counterfeit. It's plastic. Or, you know, some composite. How did I know? How did I know? I took the time to investigate, to watch his actions. And that turtle doesn't have Tommy Tortuga actions. He doesn't have Tommy Tortuga fruit. He's just a lump just sitting there. The Lord is trying to tell us that everybody who makes a positive response to the gospel does not bear spiritual fruit and experience a changed life. That's what he's saying. And here are three conditions of people's hearts in which they do not follow through. That's not on you. That's not on me. I've got to deal with my own heart. And as a pastor, I've got to do the very best I can to give every person who comes to faith in Christ every opportunity to grow and experience and produce spiritual food, uh, fruit and experience to change life. Amen? Amen? But this is of a concern. Amen? Mm -hmm. Now, let's move on. To the conditions for conversion in verse 8. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, and some 100. Verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit. Look at that. Bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. You notice... The difference uh, automatically. You, you, it is clear as night and day. What is the difference? The fruit. The fruit of a changed life. Why? The heart is prepared for the seed. That's right. The heart is prepared for the seed. And it says that these are they which are sown on good ground. In verse 8 it says the other fell on good ground. Good ground equals plowed and cultivated. And you deal with the rocks and you deal with the weeds. When a farmer goes out to sow, he doesn't throw it everywhere. He plows. He cultivates. He plows up the hard ground. He deals with the rocks. He deals with the weeds. Why? So the seed can go deep into the earth and have every chance of germinating and bearing fruit for which that was his purpose for sowing. Amen? So the heart to receive the gospel needs to be spiritually prepared. Got to deal with that hard-hearted stuff. You got to deal with that shallow commitment. You got to deal with all of the influences and everything. How do you do that? The heart that is spiritually prepared has got to be under the sound of the gospel. They need to hear it over and over and over. They've got to have some time. And they've got to understand the price and the cost of being a disciple. That Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow after me. That's commitment. That's sacrifice. That's surrender. We've got to give people and individuals who that we're ministering to time for the Spirit of God to bring conviction and plow up the hardness of their heart. To deal with all the influences and to help them understand that this is not a fire insurance policy that they're taking on just in case this happens to be true. That you are surrendering your life to God. And as you surrender your life to God as much as you know how, the Spirit of God is going to come into you and regenerate you and make you a new creation in Jesus Christ. And He's going to give you a new appetite, appetite, new attitude, 
and new actions. And we're going to see the Lord working in your life. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. That doesn't mean that you're always going to be at church. That doesn't mean that you're going to always do everything that's right. Doesn't mean that you'll never backslide because you will do all of those things. But you will not fade away into oblivion. Amen. Because the Spirit of God lives within you and the Lord's going to draw you back. He's going to chastise Amen. you. He's going to do whatever He needs to do to get you back in proper fellowship with Him. Amen? Amen. So the heart has got to be spiritually prepared. Next. This heart believes and receives. Verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it. That word is defined in the word study as to receive, embrace with assent, agreement. And what's that last word right there? Obedience. None of this, or at least not too much of this. Uh-uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going today. I'm not going to do that, Lord. I'm not going to change this. I'm not going to give up that. No, no, no. You're going to obey. You're going to be willing to receive Christ into your heart and your life. You're going to surrender to the Lord as much as you know how. And then you're going to go with the Lord. Amen. But as many as received Him, to them are given the right, the power, the authority to become the sons and daughters of God, even to them that believe on His name. Believing is receiving into your heart. Get that seed in there where you've got proper depth. Let that thing germinate. Let it send out its roots so that you grow and produce fruit. Amen? Amen. Amen. This heart believed and received. This heart bears fruit. Verse 20 says, Such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth what? Fruit. Some thirtyfold, some sixty, some hundredfold. Fruit is the evidence of a changed Life. Let me say that again. Fruit is the evidence of a changed life. Notice 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. What is that? That's the different levels of fruit bearing. That's the different levels of maturity. Some people have been walking with the Lord for a long time and they bear fruit 60 fold. Some have been walking with the Lord a long time and they're walking in the Spirit and they bear 100 fold. Some Christians bear 30 fold. But what is the difference here? And what is the secret? The secret is fruit bearing. We bear fruit at different rates. Different seasons in our life. We may get down to where we're not bearing any fruit at all because we're living in rebellion. But you're not going to stay there and disappear like nothing ever happened. Because if something happened, you've given your heart to the Lord. And he lives in your heart. And he's not going to let you live in that state forever and ever and ever. Amen? Amen. You're going to be bearing fruit to the glory of God. So this heart was spiritually prepared. It was prepared to receive the word. It believed and received Christ into its heart and life. And this heart bears fruit. That's the bottom line. None of the other examples bear fruit. Oh, they had foliage. They looked good for a while. But when tribulation and persecution came, they were gone. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust and the desire for other things choked it out. Never bore spiritual fruit. Amen? Amen. You might want to pray over this and study this for a while. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says... If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. What is that? New things, old things, uh, old things become new. What, what is that? Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. What is that? A changed life. Change attitude. Change appetite. Want to eat different things. Want to pursue the Lord. Care about spiritual things. Different actions. You have actions and fruit that looks like a believer. Amen? Amen. Amen. I can tell you, you're really excited about this. <laughs> this picture was taken about a decade ago. This is our oldest grandson, William. This is about 18 months or two years after his father passed away. We tried to spend as much time with the kids then as we could and uh, play with them. William's about six years old. 
right here. And uh, we were playing together that day and having some fun. And I told William, I said, son, I'm going to get you. <laughs> I've been tickling him and that kind of thing. And we got outside and was running around. I said, son, I'm going to get you. He said, no, you're not. I said, William, I'm going to get you and I'm going to tickle you good. He said, no, you're not, Grandpa. And I said, William, why do you think that I'm not going to get you? He said, Grandpa, you're just an old man. <laughs> just an old man. Well, I called him. Amen. And I tickled him. Amen. And I got him good. But you know, a lot of unwise people treat God the same way. Think he's just an old God. He's an old man. He don't have power. He don't have authority over my life. He's never going to call me into account. And Jesus said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. This Bible says that God is the creator. This Bible says that God is the redeemer and the judge. And when your life is over and my life is over as we know it, we're going to appear before God. And we're either going to appear before Him as Redeemer or Judge. And if you have given your heart to the Lord in truth and you're bearing spiritual fruit of a changed life, He'll blame you. You're His. He'll accept you. Through his dearly beloved son. Because he has redeemed you by his blood. And by his grace. Amen? Amen. But if you have not given your heart to the Lord. You will appear before him as a judge. And he will judge your sinfulness. And your sin. And then he'll turn you into a devil's hell. And you'll pay your own sin debt for all eternity. The heart factor it's the key thing. Have we given him our hearts? Has he redeemed us and regenerated us? And we've got the evidence of a changed life. The heart factor is the main factor. Amen? Amen. Let's bow before the Lord.